It is good to see you on this uh, spring break morning. The wind is up a little bit. It's supposed to be colder during the day, but we're glad that you're here for worship this morning. Elisha Hoffman was a Presbyterian preacher in the 1800s who spent most of his career in Ohio and southern Michigan. He wrote over 2,000 hymns. Many of them you know. But in 1887, he wrote, leaning on the everlasting arms, safe and secure from all alarms. I wonder if Elisha Hoffman had read the Exodus story when he wrote that hymn. In Exodus, we find the, pre the presence of God casting out these wicked, wicked plagues upon the land of Egypt showing his power and showing his destructive might. It doesn't seem to instill a sense of confidence in the people of Israel as they are wandering around in the wilderness. They seem to question whether or not God will come through for them when they need it most. In Exodus chapter 15, the first 21 verses are a praise to God for his deliverance. The 24th verse the children of Israel are standing before Moses and they are saying, you brought us out here to die. And they sound like Yogi Berra. There is no food and it tastes terrible. Think about it. <laughs> if there is no food, how do you know what it tastes like? And then the passage read, read a while ago from Numbers. They did the very same thing. There is no food, there is no water, and it tastes terrible. We're not sure you can deliver us from what comes before us. What's happened in Numbers 21 that, that uh, Rhett read earlier, the children of Israel have come out. The Lord has conquered a group of Canaanites and given them into the children of Israel's hands. And now they're going back around by the Red Sea and they're going to walk around the nation of Edom. And the people say to themselves, why not take a shortcut? The Lord has given us the Canaanites. He'll give us the Edomites. Let us walk across their country, come what may. And they are grumbling against Moses, and they say, there's nothing to eat, and it tastes terrible. And then the scripture says, the Lord sent serpents among the people. That does not sound like Elisha Hoffman's hymn. Leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm, safe and secure from all alarms. The Lord has sent serpents to bite the people. And some of them become sick and some of them have died. And suddenly, these people who were complaining about the food and complaining about the trip, they need God and they need Moses again. They come to Moses and they ask him, is there anything that God will do for us? And Moses goes and he prays about it and the Lord gives him an unusual answer for what you find in the Old Testament. The Lord told Moses to create a snake out of bronze, to put it up on a pole and put it in the midst of the camp and if anyone's bit by a snake, they can look toward, the, toward that snake on the pole and they'll be healed. Now the scripture says a lot about idolatry. It says a lot about carving images. But here in this circumstance, the people are told to look toward the bronze serpent that's been placed in the middle of the camp, and if they look at it, they will live. If they don't look at it, they'll not live. It's unusual. Unusual for the Old Testament that the Lord would face in the midst of the people a bronze snake. And we're told in 1 Kings chapter 18, when King Hezekiah is clearing out the high places for false worship, he sees the people bowing down toward the snake and offering the snake sacrifices. And King Hezekiah orders that Moses' bronze snake be destroyed. And you have to ask yourself, if they pleaded toward God, why wouldn't God just heal them? Why wouldn't God just provide some kind of miraculous anti-venom to come into the camp and seize the people. Instead, he leaves them with sharp fangs and poison. And he says, if you want to be saved, look toward the snake in the middle of the camp. It 
I have read some of the most respected scholars in Old Testament history, and nobody has a good reason for the snake on the pole. Nobody has a theological answer. Yes, the people needed the snake on the pole because of X, Y, Z. The only thing that we come up with as to why there's a snake on the pole is that it forced the people to make a choice. They could say, if I look at the snake, the Lord will heal me. Or they could lie in their pain and plead out that God would do something else. They have to make a choice. Look at the snake or don't look at the snake. Now we're in John chapter 3 this morning, beginning in the 14th verse. And John reaches back to Numbers 21 and gathers that same image. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, But those who do not believe are not condemned. Those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. That snake was raised up in the camp of the Israelites. And when they were bit by a snake, they could look or they could not look. It was their choice. John says, just like that snake raised on that pole, so the Son of Man is lifted up. And he packs inside this description that 16th verse, which is the favorite verse of most all Christians. It is simple. It is direct. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We learn that from the nursery through elementary schools and we quote it when we're senior adults. It is the verse that captures God's love for us. It is the verse that captures what Elisha Hoffman is talking about when he says leaning on the everlasting arms, safe and secure from all alarms. That's what he's talking about. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son God loves us, but in sending his son in that gracious heavenly overture, God sets up a choice. You can look, you cannot look. Verse 18 says, those who do not look are condemned already. God has given his son. He has given his son in grace. He's given his son in love. It is a sacrificial gift. It is there for all who choose to believe. But for those who do not look, judgment is there. It is a double-edged sword of God's grace. You accept, you don't accept. Life, judgment. Free gift, punishment. Either way, it's there. You accept, you don't accept. It's up to you. And in the, in the not accepting, there is that judgment. And in verse 19, John goes on to say the reason people don't accept is because people like darkness more than they like light. That may be the strongest sentence in the whole third chapter. Early in his life, 
Rudy Rudabaugh bought land and built a ranch near Gunnison, Colorado. It's called the 7-Eleven Ranch. And about 20 years ago, he married Deborah. She was divorced and she had two children, Stephanie and Jesse. Excuse me, Stephanie and Jacob. And they've lived all their lives on that ranch. And Rudy passed away in 2009 and he left it to Deborah. And Deborah wrote a will stating that upon her passing, the, the, the 7 Eleven ranch worth over $3 million would go to Stephanie, to Jacob, and to one of Rudy's children from his first marriage. In May of 2015, the 29 year old mixed martial arts expert Jacob went missing. His mother said, I thought he went with friends to Denver. The friend said, he didn't go with us. Nobody seen Jacob for weeks. <clears throat> friends are looking. Mama's looking. After about a month, she files a missing persons report. Still, no Jacob. They keep looking. Pressure builds. Sheriffs show up at her house one afternoon, wanted to follow up with a few more questions, and finally she confesses. I shot him in bed. I drug him outside. He's a front-end loader, and I buried him in the manure pile for the horses. Then I got worried that the wild animals might come up, and I buried him in a pit that Rudy used to put sheep in who had died. Now, Deborah is, weighs 70 pounds, 69 years old, and had just had her gallbladder removed the week before Jacob went missing. The sheriff's deputy scratched their heads. That didn't make sense. So they got a warrant, and they started going through the house, and there in the safe they found a will that was dated a week prior to when Jacob went missing. Jacob was out of the will, left the entire 7-Eleven ranch to Stephanie. Stephanie put on Facebook how she could not believe her mother would murder her own son. The sheriff's department in Gunnison turned up the pressure on Stephanie and found out that Mama had indeed shot Jacob, her son, in bed. But Stephanie and her husband, Richard, had done the rest of the work. John said in verse 19, people are turned toward darkness. They like the darkness more than the light. And there it is. Money over blood. Jody Mann and Robert Ursay live in Austin, Texas. They run a conspiracy theory website. For the last month, they have been knocking on doors, making phone calls, ambushing people coming out of the post office, waiting on people coming out of the restaurant, and standing outside the church in Sutherland Springs, harassing the church members of Sutherland Springs, who remember lost 26 people last November in that tragic shooting, harassing those church members to produce birth certificates and death certificates for their loved one because they think the whole thing was staged and set up by the government. They have been knocking on members' doors in Sutherland Springs saying, we think the government staged this. There's, it was all a front. Nobody ever saw any dead bodies. Those graves are empty. This is all a hoax. And it came to a head this week 
when for the fifth time they were waiting in front of the church for the pastor to show up who had lost a 14-year-old daughter and he had had his fill. Now these people have given their lives to theories of darkness. And John said people love darkness more than they love light. And he said you can tell those who have chosen by the darkness and the light and you and I are in here this morning, and I'm going to make an assumption that if you're here on a Sunday morning, especially a Sunday morning of spring break, when somebody's messed with the clock in an evil way, <laughs> you're people of light. I'm going to make the same assumption about the people who are going to take the time to watch us at 1 o'clock on Channel 6, and will tune in sometime during the week on the internet. You're people of light. And when I tell the stories like I told the story about murdering someone over land in Colorado, or I tell the story about having the audacity to knock on the grave and on the door of a parent asking for a birth certificate and a death certificate to prove that child ever lived, that is, that is beyond the pale for you. You cannot put yourself in those shoes because you've chosen light. But John said... The world chooses darkness. The numbers are not in for 2017 yet. But according to Open Door Research and the United States State Department, 2016 was the most deadly year to be a Christian in the world. According to those two groups, 215 million Christians live in an area that either has high to extremely high persecution. Now, you know most of those places in your head, but the emphasis is shifting. And we know North Korea has been the number one persecutor of Christians for the last 25 years. There are 50,000 Christians in work and labor camps right now in North Korea. The only religion allowed in North Korea is the worship of the family. That's it. We know Muslim extremism is rising in what's going on in the Middle East related to Christians. But Hindu extremism is on the rise too is along with Indian nationalism and the persecution of Christians in India has increased fourfold in the last five years. India is becoming a very desperate place to be a Christian. But this is going to surprise you. One of the places where Christian persecution is on the rise is Mexico. Lauro and his family encountered Baptist missionaries a few years ago and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They believed. They were recently forced out of their community because they would no longer go to the only church in town that practiced spiritual arts. They rejected the, Mex the tradition of the Mexican heritage of the dark arts, and they came to Jesus Christ and they were in, and Laura was in prison four times in one year before they were driven out of town. Baptist missionaries in Mexico have story after story after story after story of believers who have come to Jesus Christ and been forced out of the place where they live. You don't think about it being that close. But on Thursday friend of mine called me. Steve Vernon called from the Baptist General Convention of Texas, and we did a little bit of executive board business, and he said, I'll, I'll tell you what. He said, I went to the Baptist World Alliance meeting in Dallas, the first part, in Washington, D.C., the first part of this week, and I have to tell you, Stacy, it's the first good news I've heard about the Christian faith in 10 years. He said, <clears throat> he said, and I don't know why we're not getting these numbers out more. But in Central and South America, the growth of people coming to Christ and becoming Baptist is sometimes on the scale of 4,000% every five years. 
He said, we are seeing people come to Christ in Brazil, in Chile, in Ecuador, up through the Honduras and Nicaragua, and people coming to Christ by the thousands. Now, we've, we've seen a revival in Central and South America among Pentecostal denominations, but they're, they're coming in among Baptists. And he said, Stacy, I got in a room with some of those Central American guys, and they were absolutely on fire for what the Lord is doing. People are choosing light over darkness in those countries. Rodolfo Moreno grew up in Nicaragua. A brilliant, brilliant. At 14 years of age, he graduated from high school in Nicaragua, and he chose to go to seminary. By the time he's 16, he's graduated from seminary, and he's been given an invitation to pastor a church. Rodolfo starts pastoring that church, and the Somoza government is beginning to continue to intimidate the people, and that was when the United States government withdrew their support for the Somoza regime, and Americans pulled out and left the nation on its own. And it became the Somoza government against the Sandinistas. And as a pastor, he began to see the, the uh, persecution going on from the Somoza government, and he joined this group of revolutionaries. And he rose up in the ranks among the Sandinistas as they fought against the Somoza regime. And he became a hardened soldier. 14 years old, graduated. 16 years old, graduated from seminary. Now he's become a soldier and a ranking officer. And he's fighting for what he thinks is the cause of overturning this government for the cause of truth and righteousness. When they overthrew the Somoza government and the Sandinistas began to establish their own government, guess what they found out? They were just as corrupt as the people before them. And Rodolfo Moreno left Nicaragua and went to Costa Rica, took on a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in economics. And when the government, the Sandinistas were thrown out of power and the, and the government was taken away from the communists, they asked him to come back. And he came back and through his economic degree and help from engineering friends, reestablished the railroad in Nicaragua. But he could not get away from the nagging call that he ought to be a pastor. It was real to him when he was 16, and it was real to him when he was 45. So he had two offers. One, he could go run the import-export bank for the government of Nicaragua, or he could have become a pastor. The import-export bank paid over $5,000 a month. The church that wanted him to become the pastor was able to pay $32 a month. So he did what any reasonable person would do. He chose the church. Became the pastor. And today he's the head of the Nicaraguan Baptist Convention. You see... John says you can tell the people who choose the light from those who choose the darkness. God loves us so much that he's given his only son to come into this world to redeem us from the sin that is killing us. But in his coming, he sets up a choice. A choice to believe or a choice to not. Where are we? Because for those who believe, those are the folks, like Rodolfo, who changed the world. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the stories of light in a dark world. It's not hard to see the darkness all around us. It's on our phones. It's on our televisions. It's before us in our computers. But Father, we thank you that you sent your son into the world giving light and that there are countless people prompted by your spirit to choose light and to follow you. Father, I pray today that our service and our time of commitment, if that spirit is prompting someone here, 
to look toward your son and believe that they would do so. Father, in this time of commitment, we ask that your spirit move among us, calling us out of what we were to what we can be, bringing us from the darkness to the light so we may live and serve you and change this world. Father, I thank you for the gift of your son, and I ask in this time that you bless our spirits and draw us toward you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to sing the hymn, The Nail-Scarred Hand. You come this morning with whatever decisions you need to make, trusting Christ, joining with our church, whatever it is, you come as we stand and sing together.